Boa noite, então, a todos e a todas. Estamos aqui para fazer a conferência de encerramento do nosso colóquio de filosofia, colóquio Unicinos, também promovido pela Universidade Federal de Pelotas, numa parceria conosco. Agradecemos a presença de vocês e estamos aqui com o professor doutor Helmut Haidt, da Tongji University, Xangai, que hoje vai fazer o encerramento do nosso evento. É, vou apresentar o professor Helmut, alguns dados breves da sua grande trajetória filosófica. O professor Helmut Haidt é professor associado de filosofia e vice-reitor da Academia para as Culturas Europeias na Universidade de Tongji, em Xangai. Estudou filosofia e ciência política em Hanover. Trabalhou, em, trabalhou na Leibniz Universität, na Universidade da Califórnia, em San Diego, e na Universidade Humboldt, de Berlim. Além disso, em 2010, foi professor de filosofia na Leibniz Universität Hanover e trabalhou como palestrante em negócios e em sociedade na Escola de Negócios de Munique. As visitas de pesquisas o levaram de 2012 a 2013 ao Instituto de Estudos Avançados em Princeton, à Universidade Federal de Pelotas e ao Kolleg Friedrich Nietzsche, em Weimar, em 2015. O trabalho de Helmut Haidt centra-se na filosofia grega antiga e na sua recepção, bem como nas filosofias dos séculos XIX e XX, especialmente no que se refere ao pensamento de Friedrich Nietzsche. Ele está interessado na conexão das questões científicas e epistemológicas com temas filosóficos, culturais, históricos e sociais. Helmut Haidt é coeditor dos estudos de Nietzsche e as monografias e textos da pesquisa de Nietzsche, que são publicadas pela Greuter Verlag. É autor de inúmeras obras filosóficas, que eu não vou citar aqui para privilegiar o tempo de exposição do professor Helmut Haidt. Herr Professor, uh, Sie haben 40 Minuten zu sprechen, ja? Gut. Gut. Vielen Dank. Okay. So, thank you very much for having me here. Um, thanks for the invitation. Adios an Marcia. It's very nice to be here. I'm very sorry that I don't speak Portuguese. The only Portuguese sentence I can is now fala Portuguese. Um, so this is not much. Um, but I prepared some slides and I hope you will be able to follow. So my topic today is Nietzsche, Foucault and the genealogy of truth and um, I give you a brief outline of what I'm talking about. First I will briefly reconstruct the traditional story about the origin of the will to truth. Then I will discuss what traditionally has been said to explain this event and then I will turn to a brief comparison of Nietzsche and Foucault and then I discuss Foucault's genealogy of the will to truth and then Nietzsche's and then I will conclude with some um, remarks on how to proceed 131 years after the publication <laughs> of a genealogy of morals. Okay, so the origin of the will to truth um, has a standard story of Western philosophy which is the will to truth has a beginning as a social and cultural institution. And I give you a quotation which is somehow paradigmatic for this traditional idea. It's by Bruno Snell, um, 1948, a little early, but um, you, okay, so I read the passage first. European thinking begins with the Greeks. They have made it what it is, our only way of thinking. Its authority in the Western world is undisputed. Well, a <laughs> little different today. Uh, when we concern ourselves with the sciences and philosophy, we use this thought quite independently of its historical ties to focus upon that which is constant and unconditioned upon truth. And with his help, we hope to grasp the unchanging principles of life. This is what Bruno Snell said in 1948. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I assume that almost everybody of you encountered something like this, because this is the standard 
story you are told in the history seminars on Western philosophy. Or if you have a book on Western philosophy and you open it at the beginning, there will be something about, yeah, philosophy, such and such. And then it began with Thales <coughs> or Parmenides or one of these ancient Greek figures. This is a standard story. Um, and it has two basic problems or two basic questions are connected to this um, idea. First of all, what is it what came into being apparently in ancient Greek? And so what is the will to truth? This is a more philosophical question. And the other question is how did it come into being? So how could we explain the particular origin of philosophy in antiquity? The origin of philosophy in antiquity understood as the social and cultural beginning of the will to truth as an institution. Um, okay, so the answer to this tradition, traditional problem is also very traditional. It goes back to Aristotle. Parts of it are already in Plato. So with respect to the systematic question, what is the will to truth? They basically say the will to truth is the highest motivation of humanity. It is a, a noble part of what human being is about. It is, many say, it is inevitable, inevitably required for communication and culture. So we necessarily need it. Um, it realizes itself best in philosophy and science. So philosophy and science are the most advanced realizations of this will to truth. It drives an, a quest for superior knowledge. So some say this quest is unended or um, some say we achieve it. It depends on, most people today would say it's an unended quest. Okay. How did it come into being? The historical question. The historical question is usually answered um, with respect to human nature, arguing, well, it is the most noble part of human nature. Therefore, ultimately, there is no real explanation needed because, I mean, we don't explain the will to food or so. We say, yeah, sure, everybody needs food. This is not a need of explanation because this is just what human beings are about. This is why we call ourselves somehow proudly homo sapiens, so the intelligent or wise animal. Um, it flourished for the first time in ancient Greek culture as an emancipatory step from myth to reason. This is um, the terminology often employed. And Western culture inherits its achievements by means of a more or less continuous progress. Um, this is also, I think, how the standard concept of the history of philosophy is not arbitrarily but necessarily connected to some kind of Eurocentrism. So this is not accidentally here. Um, but it has, it has its root in this particular story. Okay, so now I give you a more systematic um, construction of the argument, um, which is the standard Hegelian and Aristotelian and also contemporary story goes like this. First premise, I call it an anthropological premise. The first premise is all men naturally desire knowledge. This is actually the first sentence of uh, Aristotle's metaphysics. And then, second premise, true knowledge is best knowledge. This is also what Aristotle argues in the next lines of the beginning of metaphysics. This is an epistemological premise, that such kind of knowledge um, is what we actually ultimately desire. Um, if we combine these two premises, we um, get a third premise, which is the will to truth is a natural drive. So it's part of human nature. And this, I would say, from a Nietzschean perspective, is a psychological premise. Um, if this is the case, so all men naturally desire knowledge, knowledge is the best thing we aim for, then the explanation is not so difficult. 
because it, it wants to come into being anyways. So it comes into being as soon as conditions apply. And um, this is what I think the, the core idea of an evolutionary premise, that the origin of the will to truth is not really, need an ex not really needs an explanation because it comes into being as soon as possible. So whenever it is not prevented from coming into being. And therefore, um, these people focus on the ancient Greek situation, arguing that the Greek conditions were favorable. So in Greek, this is a first requirement, leisure. They had free time. They were, there was some economic basis already set. People were free to, um, to think about deeper things or to, to engage in more fundamental ambitions. So leisure is one of the requirements. The other one um, where uh, Hegel points to in particular is freedom, which is mainly freedom of a dogmatic religious system. So philosophy did not emerge in Babylonia or Egypt mm -hmm. because there we had these uh, doctrinate priest castes and they prevented philosophy from develop. And of course you need to have smart people. So you need to have um, personnel which is capable of achieving something and the Greeks, yeah, well, we know they were just geniuses. Um, we don't think of that that much today, probably, unf unfortunately, but this is um, the idea. So this is um, the historical premise. The conditions were favorable, exceptionally favorable in ancient Greece and therefore the solution is easy will to truth emerge naturally in ancient Greece. Uh, this, I would say, is the basic structure of the way the story is usually told. And um, some advertisement, <laughs> I dedicated um, my PhD project to this topic and wrote a book on it. Um, it's in German, so in a tough, unbearable language. Anyhow, I, I did that. Um, Okay, so I think this is clear and, and not too controversial. Mm -hmm. um, Nietzsche and Foucault, I would say, um, disagree with this story. So they pose a number of question marks to this particular story regarding the will to truth, in part for similar, in part for different reasons. Um, first of all, both agree with the standard story that the will to truth has some history. So that it is, that it somehow appeared and that it somehow played a role. So none of these deny that there is something like a will to truth. They accept the phenomenon. This I think is important. And both question, I would say, every single premise of the argument I reconstructed. So they have question marks with respect to all the five premises. And both propose or employ genealogy uh, in a debunking critical spirit in order to deconstruct or replace this traditional story with another um, hopefully better image. Um, Nietzsche famously um, in the preface of the genealogy of morals invites us to decipher the hieroglyphy, hieroglyphic uh, scripture, to focus on the gray, uh, to overcome our prejudices, and we heard a lot about this, so I think this is clear, Nietzsche, what Nietzsche has in mind here. Very similarly, Foucault, in a paper um, on Nietzsche genealogy and history, uh, in 1971, writes that the genealogy of values, of morality, of ascetism, of cognition, therefore, does not have to start with the search for its origin and to exclude the multiple episodes of history because of its inadequacy, but rather it has to stay with the details and coincidences of the beginning. So this already indicates that Foucault in contrast to um, the standard story, thinks that there is something which we need to account for. So there is a problem here. It's not like philosophy 
would emerge naturally and then evolve in a continuous process. But we must focus on the details, on the coincidences. We must recognize all the layers which were overlapping one another in a long and complicated history. Whereas um, the, the concept of origin, of Ursprung, um, implies that there is a kind of sacred beginning which justifies the, the outcome. There is a continuity between the sacred beginning and the final outcome. And this, Foucault would say, and many others, this is a kind of mythological kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. I can say more about that in the discussion, and uh, I hope this will become more clear. Um, Foucault, I would say, uh, it's a little dangerous talking about Foucault so much with Anani sitting in, in front of me. Ich fürchte mich ein wenig über Foucault zu sprechen, wenn du da sitzt. Um, <laughs> ich hoffe, alles geht gut. Um, so, Foucault concentrates on the archives. He's really doing work on the details, on the gray and dusty parts. And I, th and I think this is why he, uh, with some consequence, often in his earlier walks, speaks of archaeology. So the order of things is an archaeology of the human sciences, and then he has the archaeology of, of knowledge. Uh, and the term archaeology is probably also very fitting, because this, if you imagine an archaeologist on the field who is um, having a... Um, a small brush and searching for the details and for the fragments of some ancient vase in the ground. And so this is a very dusty work. Um, he aims to describe um, the history of something without evolutionists and without moral prejudice. So this is very Nietzschean. But I would say that in regard of his focus, on, on the details and the sources, he's really a critical historian. Um, Nietzsche, on the other hand, to some degree, proposes this methodology. He invites historical studies, famously in the footnote at the end of the first uh, treaty. Um, but his genealogies are, I would say, physio-psychological sketches. So he does not really do genealogy in a sense Foucault does it. Because I think he does, just doesn't want to spend so much time in the archives. He has a different interest. Um, so he uses stereotypes um, like the priest, the philosopher, uh, the Jews, the slaves, and he also uses exaggerations. And with respect to these exaggerations, I would say deliberately so, because, as Horkheimer Adorno say in the Dialectic of Enlightenment, only the exaggeration is true. And this sentence I love very much, because only the exaggeration is true is, of course, an exaggeration. Um, because <laughs> it's not only the exaggeration true. But I think, like in a piece of art, if you exaggerate, you make something visible. You point to something which is significant. So ultimately, I would say, Nietzsche has a different project. In the preface, he mentions that. Which was, was in retrospect to Human All to Human, he says, I was preoccupied with something much more important than the nature of my hypothesis, of hypotheses, mine or anybody else's, on the origin of morality. So he isn't ultimately, I would say, he's not so much this is not his main focus, to reconstruct the history of morality. This is more like an instrument for him, a, t a tool, a requirement for something more ambitious. And this is why I would say that Nietzsche is a philosopher. It, it's probably a little too much of a contrast if I say Foucault is a historian and Nietzsche is a philosopher, but I think um, there is some truth about it. In, and probably Foucault would even admit that he doesn't mean to be a philosopher in this ambitious meaning of the word. Okay, so let's turn to Foucault's genealogy of 
the will to truth. Um, Foucault acknowledges Nietzsche's influence at various occasions. One, a very illuminating, I think, in a conversation with um, Paolo Caruso, published in 1969. There he says, as far as the actual influence of Nietzsche on me is concerned, it is difficult it is difficult for me to clarify it, precisely because I realize that it was very profound. I can only say that I was ideologically a historicist and a Hegelian until I read Nietzsche. So this is, um, I think, a fair um, description and it also fits many other occasions where he speaks about Nietzsche. He attributes to Nietzsche, and interestingly to Marx, um, that they increased our awareness of decentration. They increased our awareness that there is no center and that there is a multitude of variations and um, differences. This is in um, AOK means um, archaeology of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, he continues to argue um, the forces in the play of history obey neither a determination nor a mechanics. So this is anti-standard Marxism, of, of course, mainly anti-Hegelianism, mm -hmm. but the chance of struggle. So what emerges in history is not determined in any sense. It is just the outcome of a particular situation in within which different forces are struggling. This is how history teaches us to laugh at the celebration of the origin. So we stop talking about Ursprung as sacred or holy beginning of something. Um, we rather turn to uh, historical units of which we realize that they are dynamic, interchanging, um, unclear, divided, um, discursive formations, how he calls them. And I will speak a little more about this discursive formations. Um, so Foucault um, remains within the domain of discourse. He does not assume a position like Hegel, where you look at a process from like outside and see the result and see the structure. You are within the domain of discourse, not outside of it. And um, archaeological analysis, as he proposes it, individualizes and describes discursive formations. And I think this is important that he focuses on, on this descriptive element. So you figure out what kind of discor discourse formed itself under certain conditions in a certain moment of time and how did it evolve, how did it change, how did this unit um, become a unit? Because there is no such thing like an epoch or, or an origin. Or the, so these units we deal with when we do history are in themselves fluid and dynamic formations. And he defines the rules of formation of an aggregate of statements. So how are they connected to what we nowadays call philosophy or physics or sexuality, homosexuality, whatever. So how are these mm -hmm. ideas formed into a particular unit? And by what rules do they, what rules do they obey? And the focus on the rules of discourse, discursive formations brings to light the power by which discourse is controlled. So what kind of forces, what kind of power is defining the rules of discourse? What is allowed to say? How should we say it? This is very obvious in this very situation. I mean, the rule of this discourse for the minute is you need to listen. I'm going to talk. You expect a talk in philosophy. Um, I should not talk about my mother now unless I have a reason. So, okay, so there are a, a very, a, a huge number of rules are in place now to make this kind of discourse possible also, but also to prevent it from getting chaotic, um, getting to increase 
too much. So we control what Foucault calls the danger of discourse. This invites four methodological principles um, Foucault points out in the order of discourse. His, um, his uh, inaugurative talk when he took over the position in, in Paris. Um, the first methodological principle he points to is reversal, which is change the perspective. Look at it from a different angle. In particular, don't look at discourse as something which allows and enriches discourse, uh, but something which is a system of reduction, which is mainly meant to control. Uh, the second um, principle is discontinuity. So don't assume a continuous process. Rather, look on events in the literal sense of the word. Event is something which happens to happen accidentally. And look at the series, how something repeats itself, how it forms a connection, but not necessarily an evolution. Look at specificity. So what's special about it? What's unusual? What is the way um, a particular praxis becomes reality and adopts and includes um, what it takes to be significant at this particular time? And the last one, outwardness. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't know the French original here. Um, outwardness seemed a little awkward to me, but the idea is, um, look at the appearance of it and um, don't assume that there is an inner goal in it, some hidden um, inner principle which realizes itself now. Look at it as something which emerged without a goal. It's actually, I think, very similar to the idea um, um, Maria Cristina pointed us to in GM 2.12. Um, uh, keep in mind the difference between the beginning of something and its final utility. So something is not goal-driven, but something just brings new possibilities about. And these new possibilities are um, something which Nietzsche is very much interested in, I would say. Okay, so um, the will to truth Foucault goes on, is one of the most, it's, it's one of the most forceful rules to shorten and control discourse. So he describes um, three main procedures of um, exclusion in a discourse. The one is taboo or prohibition, topics you're not allowed to talk about under certain conditions. The second one is the exclusion of madness. And the third one, the most powerful one today is the will to truth. This is a governing principle of the way we are required to speak, what, something we need to take into consideration. There are many others. Um, he, divide, he, he explains them in the order of discourse. Um, and then he continues um, getting to the details now probably, no doubt this demarcation, the will to truth, has been historically constituted. He says, for the sixth century Greeks, truth was in a certain situation. It was with the poet or with, um, with the priest, depending on the situation. But, as, but a century later, so a century after the sixth century, um, the highest truth was no longer in what the discourse was, in what he did, it was in what he said. One day, the truth shifted away from the ritualized, effective, and just act of statement to the statement itself, to its meaning, its form, its object, its referential relation. So rather than defining truth by the situation and the person and the context, which raises some statement, it turns to the statement itself, uh, and this is what our discussion about truth is about. I mean, correspondence, and so, these things. Um, and then he questions, briefly questions, what governs this move if not desire and power? This is a rhetorical question, I take it, but um, 
he basically leaves it like that. So it's a suggestion, but I would love to have more on that. Unfortunately, um, he does not. So with respect to um, the genealogy of the will to truth in Foucault, I, I think one could say that he gives a critical analysis of will to truth as an effective procedure of exclusion and suggests a socio-psychological explication. So the driving force behind it is desire and power and the need to control discourse. But he provides no real genealogy, as he does with madness, for example, or as he does with punishment, um, or as he does with sexuality. But not so much, unfortunately, with respect to the will to truth. Actually, in, in the order of discourse, he says, in the next time, so at the end of this lecture, he speaks about his future projects. And he says, one of my future projects is I would like to dedicate myself to the third system of exclusion, which is the will to truth. Um, and I would like to target it from two perspectives. On the one hand, I will analyze how this decision for the truth in which we are caught and which we constantly renew has come about, how it was repeated, renewed, transformed. So this would be the program of the genealogy of the will to truth. First, I will concentrate on the epoch of the sophists and the debate with Socrates and so on. Unfortunately, he did not. So he did not really pursue this project. In his work on antiquity, he has lots to, of things to say about the changing of culture um, and on parisia, and so there are things, but it's not like a real research focus on this particular issue. Nietzsche. Nietzsche introduced the question early on. I think one could say that he was the first to raise the issue of the will to truth as a problem. And I think very early on, already in truth and lie in an extra moral sense, the, the background is clear because according to Nietzsche, the human condition is far from aiming at truth. Actually, almost nothing is more co incomprehensible than how an honest and pure impulse to truth could arise among human, human beings. So he fundamentally denies the basic Aristotelian anthropology that all men naturally desire knowledge, which is truth. Nietzsche would say, no, whatever. what the heck do we need truth for? I mean, we need to get along, we need to survive, we need millions of things, but truth, well, not necessarily, it depends. So, okay, so this I think is, is the first basic requirement for him to question that. He, like Foucault also, associates the beginning of the will to truth with Socrates. In the verse of tragedy he says, one must regard Socrates as the vortex and turning point of the so-called history he is the one who destroyed the tragic consciousness with his theoretical optimism. And this is why, um, a few lines later, the image of the dying Socrates, of a man liberated from fear of death by reason and knowledge, is the heraldic shield over the portals of science, reminding everyone of its purpose, which is to make existence appear comprehensible and thus justified. So the basic uh, achievement, if you have it, of Socrates is that he, that he convinced himself so profoundly about the possibility of understanding the reality of achieving truth that he could die on it. So uh, he didn't die for it only, he, he, I mean, it solved his existential problem, Nietzsche would say, with his um, conclusion that uh, just uh, reason, equals, um, reason equals virtue equals happiness. <clears throat> okay, so Nietzsche employs genealogy, I would say, for a transvaluation and he observes that most people didn't dare to raise this question. On this question, turn to the most ancient and most modern philosophies, 
all of them lack a consciousness of the extent to which the will to truth itself needs a justification or an explication at least. Here is a gap in every philosophy. How does it come about? Now he gives an, a genealogical explication of this very gap in, in every philosophy as far as he observes it. Because the ascetic ideal has so far been master over all philosophy, because truth was set as being, as God, as the highest authority itself, because truth was not allowed to be a problem. So truth was, in Foucault's terminology, a very fundamental, stable order of discourse. You could not just question this basic rule. And we will, at the end, I will address this issue a little more. Nietzsche is, so we see Nietzsche is interested in the justification of the will to truth and in the consequences of our new possibility to know that the will to truth is and should be a problem. So this, I think, will become clear later. Um, so what is the will to truth in a systematic sense according to Nietzsche? It's connected to desire and power as we heard of Foucault. Uh, a very beautiful quotation, I think, from Zarathustra. Will to truth you call that which drives you and makes you lustful, you wisest ones? Will to think ability of all being, that's what I call your will. You first want to make all being thinkable because you doubt with proper suspicion whether it, e whether it is even thinkable. But for you it shall behave and bend, thus your will wants it. It shall become smooth and supervenient to the spirit at, as its mirror and reflection. That is your entire will, your wisest ones, as a will to power. And even when you speak of good and evil of valuations and of valuations, you still want to create the world before which you could kneel. This is your ultimate hope and intoxication. So Nietzsche turns the order around. He applies, in some sense, an ideological ide critique of ideology, arguing that um, rather than aiming for a proper understanding of the truth, the will to truth wants the opposite. The will to truth wants to create a world which would be thinkable, would be in accordance to us. So the, the measure of the world is not the world, but the people who apply what they regard as a will to truth out of um, the demand or the, the intention for control. So it's very similar, I think, at the end of the day to what Foucault has in mind. It's desire and power underlying this will to truth. How did, it, how did the will to truth emerge? How did it come into being in a historical, genealogical sense? Nietzsche would say, certainly not from favorable conditions, but rather due to a crisis. This is very nicely put in uh, Twilight of the Idols, the problem of Socrates, number 10. Its offspring is not noble, but erroneous and even ugly. It is actually, we, we spoke about that, um, Osvaldo Giacoya spoke about that. It is the most subtle and core form of the ascetic ideal itself. Like Foucault, Nietzsche uses reversal, he changes the perspective, he emphasizes discontinuity, not so much as Foucault. Uh, in Nietzsche there's more continuity, I think. Um, and he emphasizes specificity and he more, most importantly, think, I think, points to the conditions of possibility which arise out of this contemporary situation. Because he, he emphasizes that we need to mind the difference between origin and function. So again, as I, I'm very glad that Maria Cristina brought that up um, because I think this is really important and a very important element of Nietzsche's genealogy that the fact that something emerged out of ugly and erroneous circumstances does not devalue it completely. It might be that something emerged out of this by chance which now, 
offers new opportunities, which is now something we could do something with. And um, this, uh, I think, is what Nietzsche is after. So from now on, this is a semi last, the last sentence of the semi last aphorism of the genealogy of morals. From now on, morality will be destroyed by the will to truth becoming conscious of itself. So the will to truth, which originally was the highest form of morality, aiming at morality, is now destroying itself. So it's destroying the morality on which it rests by becoming a consciousness, conscious of itself. Mm -hmm. That great drama in a hundred acts reserved for Europe in the next two centuries, so we are 130 years, so it's uh, 70 years to come. Yes. The younger ones will probably see the closing <laughs> um, of this drama. Um, so the next two centuries, the most terrible, most questionable, but perhaps only also the one most rich in hope. And I think this is also a very, very Nietzschean idea, because uh, Professor Valadier at the first day um, pointed to the terrible and questionable consequences mm -hmm. of this drama. Rightly so, I would say. But Nietzsche also thinks, well, but there's also hope. There's also something promising about it. And this is where I, so I, I come to my conclusions. I, I should probably say that Nietzsche, uh, no, no surprise, also gives no real genealogy of the will to truth. I mean, Foucault would be prepared to do that, and Nietzsche not so, because he has, as I said, a different project, ultimately. Good. Excellent. Uh, okay, so the will to truth undermines itself, which means it does not end here, but it turns self-reflexive, self-examining. So philosophy goes on. It's not like coming to an end. Mm -hmm. um, for Foucault, uh, the will to truth continues to remain a powerful procedure of exclusion, uh, which is colonizing all kinds of discourse. And for Nietzsche, it remains entangled with the ascetic ideal which finally leads to its possible self-sublimation, as I said. Genealogy of will to truth reveals its basis in weakness and error. It produces struggle and cultural tensions, which in turn open new possibilities, hopes, and futures. So this is not what the will to truth initially aimed at. So this is not the goal, but it's something which became possible at the end of these 2,500 years of refined and institutionalized will to truth and the, and the Züchtung, so the, the raising it produced in mankind. Questioning the will to truth is still a dreadful scenario for many. So many people just cannot stand this whole issue. And, um, Talking to Nietzscheans mainly, I, I see uh, that you are not overly frustrated, but there are also many Nietzschean scholars who think, yeah, well, Nietzsche couldn't be serious with questioning the will to truth because this is just crazy. I mean, come on, how, how, how should this be possible? For example, Charles Larmor, um, in a very bad paper, I think, uh, also Maud Marie Clark, slightly better, but also not convincing. Um, I, I allow myself to point you to a paper I, I published in Portuguese in the Belo Horizonte Journal criterion on, on this issue, why people think this is a dreadful uh, scenario. I would rather try to say that this is not so much dreadful, actually. Um, if you think of, I mean, the problem with truth is of why we are in difficult, in, why we do have a problem without truth. Um, is because truth serves a number of important cultural functions. So we need to address certain issues, and truth is meant to address these issues. The first issue is we need to find our way in the world, literally um, and also metaphorically. So we need to orient ourselves in our environment or in our texts or in our history. So we need this. We also need successful control. 
We need to employ, we need to predict, and we need to command natural and social and cultural resources. We somehow need to cope with them in a way which, uh, which, which is efficient. And of course, um, mainly for philosophers, <laughs> we need to have procedures for justified agreement. We need to harmonize conflicts and we need to find ways to deal with contradicting opinions and convictions. So these are serious issues we need to address, of course. Um, and knowing the truth would be a clear-cut mean to achieve these needs. So if we would have the truth, then we would have reliable orientation, successful control, and justified agreement. Because I got it right, so you're going to agree. Um, this is unfortunately um, not the case. We have good reasons, and this is also a very interesting argument in Nietzsche. So it's not true that we don't have the truth. This would be self-contradictory. But we do have good reasons. We have very good reasons to assume that we don't control, don't command something like the truth. But we believe that we only command minor functional equivalents. I think that there are other less ambitious elements which are serving these needs. The pretense of absolute certainty is therefore either uninformed with uh, fools or child, or it is strategic in many cases, actually. Um, the pretense on certainty is strategic, and Nietzsche thinks this basically apply, applies to priests of all kinds. So Eugen Düring, for example, is the priest for him. And it also, and this is my, my closing remark now, it also applies, I would say, to populist politicians, to those uh, like this Elenao uh, guy who pretend to know what's true without any questioning, without any cautious reserve. Um, this is actually, I, I cannot prevent from saying that in, in Brazil, but I, I think this is really, the person described here is really a figure which appears on the political scenery in several countries these days. He who has not passed through different convictions but remains in the belief in whose net he was first captured is on account of this unchangeability under all circumstances a representative of retarded cultures. In accordance with this lack of cultivation, which foremost requires formability, so the, the German word is Bildung. So in accordance with his lack of Bildung, which for, foremost requires Bildbarkeit, so formability, um, he is a man hard, uncomprehending, unteachable, ungenerous, everlastingly suspicious and unheeding, who neglects no means of constantly asserting his own point of view because he is quite incapable of grasping that there are bound to be other points of view. So there are not only other points of view by chance, but there are bound to be other points of view. They are necessary, necessarily so. Um, so a lack of certainty and cautious reserve is a liberating and adventurous um, attitude for strong, educated, and cultural people, I would say. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much, Professor Hyde, for your brilliant explanation. It was an honor to listen to your ideas. And uh, now we have some time to make questions. OK. Uh, temos um tempo, então, para perguntas. É, eu pediria que as pessoas que fossem fazê-las se dirigissem ao professor Hyde em inglês ou em alemão. There are bound to be other views. Um, professor, I would like to make some question. I'm, I'm not sure if it's a really uh, question, but uh, this is a, a topic which uh, I'm very concerned of. Um, how we could understand this we of true 
uh, as a desire and power, mm -hmm. connecting with the will to power. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you? Yeah, okay, so this is, um, thank you very much, Marcia. This is a complicated question, I think, because um, what Nietzsche says about the will to power is also very opaque and, and hard, to, hard to decipher. But um, I would basically say that I should probably go back to this um, quotation from, from the Zarathustra, okay. where, where Nietzsche combines mm -hmm. these two things. And um, so even if we don't know exactly what will to power means in Nietzsche, I think it's clear that he employs this as a certain kind of physiologic, psychophysiology of living beings. So whatever li is alive is driving, aiming, transforming, um, mm -hmm. um, and occupying and employing the world. And I mean, uh, th th my reading of, of this basically derives from, from scholars like Müller, Lauter, or Abel. So I, I agree with them um, that even like an amoeba or so, like a small animal. If it moves around, it's looking for food, it's, it's, so it's, there is this driving impulse uh -huh. which um, interprets the world constantly. This is something I can eat, this is something dangerous, this is something I can occupy. Mm -hmm. and so this is the basic process of, of a living entity. And it wants to increase, it wants to, not only, this is the difference to Darwin, it just, it, it's not aiming after survival or preservation or something. It wants to flourish and to, right. to um, improve, or improve is the wrong word, to, to, to enrich and grow. And um, so this is, this is the desire, the drive in general. And when it comes to the details within every individual person, and Maria also spoke about that, there are a multitude of will to power. Uh -huh. So one needs to think of will to power in, in the plural. And Brilliant. they are in, in constant struggle. They are constantly mm -hmm. inter engaging with one another. One important reading for Nietzsche in this regard was, was um, Wilhelm Ruh um, on the... Um, from Kampf der Teile im Organismus, so on the struggle between the parts within the organism. So this was an evolutionary biologist who, who thought that even on the, with respect to one unit, like my body, the different drives and parts and also the different physiologi physiological elements, like my nerves, and so they are in constant interaction. Uh -huh. And the will to truth is, um, a certain product out of this chaotic interacting um, forces. And the will to truth is, is, the, is, the, is the way of trying to control this whole process. Mm -hmm. So there's one, this is one part of the story. So there's, there's this drive which has the physiological foundation mm -hmm. which is according to Nietzsche, somewhat weak, so not capable of controlling otherwise or um, achieving um, power otherwise, turns to this ambitious project of objective truth. By means it aims to control itself and the others. Right, brilliant. Thank you very much. Pessoal, perguntas? Temos uh, dois inscritos, o senhor de trás também. Perfeito. Então, a colega fala primeiro, por gentileza. Uh, thank you, Professor Hyde, for your uh, talk. And I would like to ask about... Nietzsche talks uh, a lot of truth, and there is no ultimately truth. And he also talks about perspective. Mm -hmm. And we understand um, how this relates, and... But it's, um, kind of confused yet how exactly what it really means to say 
that truth is perspectival. Yeah. Um, good. This is a different, a different and also difficult per epistemological question. Um, so, from standard view, um, the talking about perspectival truths doesn't make much sense. So something is either true or not. Um, one could, of, of course, say um, that from my perspective, um, the microphone is pointing in my direction. And from your perspective, the microphone is not pointing in your direction. So, but this is not different perspectives. I mean, it's just it's easy to reconcile these different views. Um, I would, I would say that when Nietzsche, there are also very few occasions where Nietzsche speaks of perspectival truths. Mm. Um, but when he does so, it's for, for, uh, mainly in, in the unpublished notes, my impression is that he aims to, that he employs a different concept of truths. So Nietzsche provide or employs different definitions or concepts of truths. When he speaks about uh, when he criticizes truth, I think he's usually thinking about correspondence, the traditional concept of absolute correspondence. And this, he says, we don't have. And um, when he speaks about perspectival truth, um, I think he's more focusing on, um, on, on something like certainty. So more like a psychological state of confidence in something you accept or take for granted. And this is one, I, I would say, one of the functional equivalents of traditional concepts of truth. And they are actually um, very, I mean, this is at the end of the day easy to understand because um, we are bound in a, little, in a certain body with a certain physiological capacities. We employ certain language. We employ a certain kind of mindset. Our perspective is defined by the grammar we mm -hmm. use, by the cultural background, by the evaluations we take, by the knowledge we acquire from others. So this makes up a certain perspective which then allows us to orient ourselves in the world we live in. So, so uh, I'm just a student in the beginning so forgive me if my question is silly, but as an illustration of will to truth, you mentioned that Socrates died on it and not for it. Mm -hmm. And I, maybe I, I, I don't know if I have a, a correct understanding of that, but I always thought he died for that. Could you just talk a little more about that? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, I. I there are no things like silly questions, at least uh, un <laughs> seldomly. Um, and this one is actually tough. <laughs> um, I, I would say that um, Socrates was not so much a matter of truth, who, um, who had the certain belief and therefore died for it in order to promote the, the um, the project of aiming for truth. Um, I think he rather, uh, I mean, this is probably the case for other matters as well, but with respect to Socrates, I, I think that he was confident in, in what he considered to be true, that death didn't mean anything significant to him anymore. So he didn't deliver, at least this is how Nietzsche sees it. It's not like Socrates would, um, would suffer and would um, donate himself as a, as a opfer, what is, um, as a sacrifice. He didn't sacrifice himself mm -hmm. for truth. Um, he rather, um, he rather took the chance to prove for him that he knew the truth, that he was on the right way. Because, um, so to Nietzsche, it's pretty obvious, I think, that Nietzsche, that, that Socrates basically chose. He deliberately made the Athenians 
sentence him to death. So it's not like he had to cope with that, but he was so um, arrogant in a way, so much um, confident with his or with this particular will to truth that he just, um, yeah, used it in this way. And this is why I would say he is not sacrificing himself for the will to truth, but he rather uh, was so sober and confident in this framework that he didn't need to care. That he would rather, this is why Nietzsche emphasizes this uh, little anecdote, it's, it's slightly esoteric, that um, Socrates offered um, a sacrifice to Escola, to the god of medicine. Um, this was the last thing he said, yeah, I, I owe the god of medicine some sacrifice. Um, because he um, had this profound dislike of life, according to Nietzsche. If this is satisfactory, okay. Pessoal, alguma pergunta mais? <laughs> yeah, it's also very late. Okay, um, yes, that's true. Pessoal, então, uh, encerramos aqui a nossa conferência com o professor Dr. Helmut Heitz, agradecendo a ele a sua exposição, a clareza e a exposição feita discutindo apresentando os slides e discutindo sobre eles, o que torna bastante interessante a metodologia dele expor as suas ideias. Muito obrigada a todos que vieram e se inscreveram na nossa atividade aqui do, dos três dias de colóquio. Passo a palavra para o professor Adilson Feiler, para que faça o um encerramento, então, do, do colóquio. Ah, bem. E peço ainda uma salva de palmas ao professor Helmut. Nós agradecemos a todos vocês pela participação nesse 21º Colóquio Internacional de Filosofia, aqui promovido em parceria com a Universidade Federal de Pelotas. Esperamos poder, assim, aprofundar mais os nossos laços, afinal de contas, estamos, assim, relativamente próximos, né, geograficamente falando. Então, que possamos continuar. Agradecemos aos estudantes, todos que tiveram a sua participação aqui, Faço lembrar um aspecto, é uma surpresa que eu tenho para vocês, principalmente para os que compuseram as mesas aqui e também para os conferencistas. É, o nosso editor da nossa revista Unicinos, Qualis A2, está oferecendo um número de um dossiê para a publicação de todas as apresentações aqui realizadas durante esse colóquio. Por isso eu pediria a vocês que entrassem no nosso site da revista, e colocasse, submetessem a comunicação de vocês é, como dossiê, na parte que está descrita dossiê, com um pequeno comentário ao editor da participação desse evento. E nós queremos, assim, é, publicá-los, provavelmente no, no próximo número que sairá lá pelo mês de abril, maio do ano que vem. Ok. Não, não há controvérsia, a revista Unicinos, a revista Unicinos, é a revista de filosofia Unicinos. Ah. É, o que mais? Márcia, daqui a 10 anos nós organizaremos os 140 anos da genealogia da moral, o que tu acha? <risos> a gente diz isso porque dá muito trabalho, né? Espero só depois de 10 anos, né? mas enfim. Então, agradecemos a todos vocês mesmo a participação, a paciência né, de estarem aqui esses dias conosco. É uma, uma imensa alegria. Would like to say thank you for everybody, for your help and you help to deep different aspects of the genealogy of moral and you like to you come again and participated in other in uh, uh, situations and other commitments in other uh, 
é, coloque-os with us. Muito obrigado a todos e uma boa noite.